Hello listener, the Nameless Scholar here, and today we will be looking at how the space walls fell to the worship of Kor. Lehman Russ's early experiences on Fenris left him with an abiding hatred and suspicion of sorcery, a feeling that was reinforced by what he saw during the Great Crusade. Concerned that the Thousand Suns' magics would lead them to corrupt even the Emperor, the Space Walls attacked them to avert a worse fate. When Magnus's counterattack brought them to the brink of destruction, Rus called out to his father for aid, but his pleas were instead answered by Kor, the bane of all enchantments. The Space Walls prevailed by giving themselves over to the beast within reveling in bloodletting and bestial fury. Now, as Korn's chosen legion, they have turned on the Emperor, who they see as the Arch Sorcerer. They now slaughter all in their path, taking skulls and trophies from their fallen opponents for the glory of the Blood God. Ancient Fenris, the world unto which the infant Rus came to rest, was a world of violent extremes. Trapped in an acute, elliptical orbit, its winters were long and dark, and the gravitational upheaval as Fenris passed close to its sun threw the scattered inhabited islands into turmoil. The human tribes were forced to make their living from the storm-tossed seas, building boats from few trees to survive the maturity and highs from monsters of the deep. These vessels were vital not just for fishing, but to relocate entire communities to new islands as their own sank beneath the waves. Such a harsh world forged hard and hardy people, nomads with little care for knowledge that couldn't be carried inside their heads. Survival meant not just being able to navigate the waves, but to drive the enemy into the sea, be they raiders or simply a tribe unable to defend, and hence unworthy of inhabiting the precious islands. However, it was not these people that the infant Primarch was found by, but something far more dangerous. According to Gnarul the Elder's legendary saga, the ascension of the Wolf King, he was raised in the first few years of life by a pack of Henrisian wolves, suckling from the she-wolf like a cub and hunting on all fours with the pack. It was these raids that brought him to, to contact with the tribes of man. On hearing of the wolves terrorizing his vassals, the ruler of the island ordered his bondsmen to bring back their pelts. The pack was lured into a trap and set by a word, one of their rune priests who planted the impression that one of their number was wounded and crying out for help. Once hemmed in by the steep walls of a gorg, the dense undergrowth was set ablaze, flaming arrows and the maddened animals slaughtered as they broke from cover. The boy Primarch saw his den mother charge at the hunters, only to be knocked to the floor by rune priest's eldritch lightning. With a wordless howl of fury, he leapt to the mighty she-wolf's side, scattering the humans that sought to harm her. Despite being struck by many a poisoned arrow, rage and defiance still burned within him. In the end, it was the rune tree sorcery that finally rendered him insensible. The wolves were skinned, but the feral curiosity was securely bound and returned to the halls of Thangrir, king of the Rust tribe. Seeing a challenge before him, Fengrir boasted that he would tame the feral child and teach him the human tongue. Though it started as a humorous wager, the king soon grew to regard the boy as his own son, naming him Lehman of the Rus. While he retained a certain lupine savagery, the boy took to his newfound human heritage with aplomb. His extraordinary strength Skill and cunning earned him a dominant role within the tribe and cemented his position as the rightful heir to Fengrir's throne. In Lehman Russ's rise to greatness, 
one group found themselves excluded from the king's councils, the once powerful rune priests. Some say that Ross could never forgive what they had done to the great she-wolf who had raised him. Others claim that having only recently gained the power of speech and human reason, seeing the words cloud men's minds and steal their thoughts seemed to be the worst kind of crime to the young Primarch. His instincts were vindicated when the room priests used their powers to twist loyal members of the tribe to attack Ross and the King Fangrir. Recognizing the taint of sorcery, Lehman Russ swiftly dispatched the room priests among the group and ended the attack, but not in time to prevent Fengrir from suffering a mortal wound. The freed bondsmen groveled for their lives at the feet of Lehman Russ. They spoke of how their will had been stolen, that they had been nothing but helpless puppets in the attack. They also claimed to have heard talk of the involvement and complicity of other room priests both on the island and further afield. Grimly, Lehman Russ bade them stand, and in a voice filled with certainty, made the following proclamation. To beat someone in a fair fight and prove your dominance is only right. To trick your opponent to do so, all the better. But to steal someone's mind with sorcery, to take from them the very thing that makes them human, that can never be forgiven. We will kill them all. To this end, the tribe of the Rus took to wearing torques made of solid, dependable iron, a gnome protective against sorcery. Its qualities were further enhanced by quenching the glowing metal in the blood of an enemy. Thus, protected by the time the Emperor arrived on Fenris, the newly crowned Wolf King had expunged the taint of sorcery from the island and also from those of their neighbors. Russ's early instinctual acceptance of the Emperor as his true father was severely shaken when it became clear that he was not just what the Fenrisians would call a word, but the most powerful one in the galaxy. The Emperor patiently explained the difference between wild sorcery and his own tightly controlled psychic powers, but Russ refused to listen. Even the honor of commanding a legion of the Adeptus Astartes was taken as an insult. He coldly accused the Emperor of being no better than the Rune Priests who had used others to fight their battles for them, and contemptuously threw the offered Golden Thunderbolt and Lightning Sigil to the floor. Russ confronted the Adeptus Custodes who had subtly moved to protect their lord, but the Emperor bade his guard stand aside and realizing what it would take to convince him, issued Russ a challenge. The Master of Mankind and the Wolf King fought barehanded all through that night, and as the sun rose over the wreckage of the Lodge House, the matter was finally settled. The Emperor had shown he was willing to spill his own blood rather than just demand it of his subjects, and by merely surviving that long, Russ had proved beyond doubt that he was truly one of his father's primarchs. All that remained was for the Emperor to establish his dominance without question. With a mighty blow that stunned the assembled crowd, the Emperor struck Russ square in the face and knocked him out cold. Then, to the appreciative cheers of the Fenrisians, the bloodied master of mankind placed his golden sigil around Russ's neck. In doing so, the Emperor formally passed command of the Sixth Legion to their Primarch, known ever after as the Space Wolves. When Lehman Russ awoke, he was a man transformed, at ease with his place as the enforcer of the Emperor's will amongst the stars. The Legion took the stable and previously unexplored continent of Asaheim as its base and established their fortress monastery, which they called the Fang. At the summit of the highest and most forbidding mountain peak, the original Terran Legionnaires adapted quickly to their primogenitor's whims. 
and the hardy islanders of Fenris proved to be excellent candidates to take the Helix Rupus and join their ranks. Though savage and unconventional by the standards of many other legions, the Space Wolves' innate skills as seafarers and raiders translated well to the role of bringing the lost human worlds into compliance with the impurity. Russell's legendary charm, amply backed by the threat of his ferocious warriors, persuaded all but the most true lucent planetary leaders as to the benefits of the burgeoning Imperium. On occasion, the Space Wolves found themselves fighting alongside Marines from other legions, and while Russ counted most of his brother Primarchs as firm friends, in the case of the Dark Angels, the rivalry was far from cordial. The gregarious and headstrong Russ found Lionel Johnson to be cold, arrogant, and superior, a fact made worse by them having brought a greater tally of worlds into compliance than the young Space Wolf Legion. This antipathy spilled over to such a degree that after their shared enemies had been defeated, it was common for unseemly fistfights or even blood feuds to erupt. Despite their complete trust in the Emperor, the culture of Fenris left the Space Wolves eternally vigilant for any taint of sorcery in the worlds they conquered. Where less superstitious legions blinded themselves to the truth, the Space Wolves took the same direct and bloody approach to the uncanny that they had on Fenris. It seemed that on every planet they brought in the compliance, no matter how tranquil, a coven of words lay hidden like the maggot within the apple. Though the very concept of the demonic was treated by others at the time as laughable, the Space Wolves saw them for what they were. In the face of mass possession and demonic manifestation, even the oblivion of global extinction was a kindness. While Russ himself calmed the misgivings of his men over working with aberrations like astropaths and navigators, he forcefully forbade battlefield psychers in his legion and was outspoken about their use by other Astartes. The worst offenders in Russ's eyes were the Thousand Sons. Their Primarch, Magnus the Red, believed wholeheartedly that psychic talent was the key to mankind's future and used it as an integral part of his war strategy. The first and last time the two legions fought alongside one another, they came within moments of all-out warfare. The experience convinced Russ that Magnus's explorations into the nature of the Immaterium were nothing more than thinly veiled sorceries of the blackest kind. Russ was not alone in his concerns, and on the planet of Nikea, the Master of Mankind called a council to stand in the judgment on the subject. The Wolf King was characteristically forthright in his views and supported with damning testimony from like-minded Primarchs such as Mortarion, Korax, and even Rogaldor. Magnus's fate appeared sealed. When judgment came, the Thousand Sons were not only allowed to continue their practices, but also given leave to soul bind themselves to the Emperor. Fearing that Magnus had used his corrupt powers to influence their father's decision, Russ stormed from the council and laid plans to save the Emperor from himself. Believing that the soul binding ritual would allow Magnus to poison the Emperor's essence with sorcery, Russ gathered his entire legion together to attack the Thousand Sons' homeworld of Prospero. To their credit, not a single brother shied away from the terrible thing the Wolf King had asked of them. With all their cunning and skill, the Space Wolves were able to catch the Legion of Sorcerers unaware, chasing off their fleet and blasting their orbital defenses into wreckage before descending onto the planet below. What they found beneath the shining white city's veneer of purity sickened the Space Wolves to the core. They uncovered entire libraries of sacrilegious texts, buildings constructed for the sole purpose of conducting black rites, and a populace who openly bore the mark of the mutant and the witch. 
while the space walls drew the noose around the heavily protected capital city of Tisca. Russ had no qualms about ordering sustained orbital bombardments to scour the lesser cities from the face of the planet. The space walls advanced cautiously beneath the protective shield curtain and at first met only scattered resistance. Emboldened, they pressed on, only to find the city itself becoming a labyrinth, as though the buildings themselves were moving and rearranging to divide the forces. It was then that the Thousand Suns finally shoved themselves. Isolated and unsupported, the space walls were attacked from all sides by balefire and mind-numbing enchantments. Their iron torques were of little use against such potent magics, and with his legion dying around him, Ross called out to his father, to anyone, for aid in destroying the sorcerers. The answer came from deep within him. It was the personification of the bestial fury that had boiled inside his soul since he had first run with the wolf pack on Fenris. It was part of him that yearned to slaughter whole worlds, to feast upon warm flesh, and to swim in oceans of blood. The howl that stared at the back of Ross's throat echoed from the shining towers and was in turn taken up by every space wolf in the city. In an instant the enchantments faltered, the insane cartography shifted back to the norm, and the etheric lightning guttered and died in the sorcerer's hands. Transformed into little more than slavering beasts, the space wolves fell upon their tormentors. Only after they had reduced the city of Tiska to a charnel pit, they returned to anything resembling sanity. They did so within the name of their savior, on their written lips, Korn, the god of blood and skulls, the bane of all sorcery. There were bodies of thousand sons among the piles of corpses, but not nearly enough to account for their full numbers. Most tellingly, of Magnus himself, there was no sign. Stalking through the rubble of the Primarch's tower, sparked a memory of battle in Ross that changed the Legion forever. He remembered fighting the Cyclops Primarch, trading blows which shook buildings to their very foundations, just as he had Magnus at his mercy. A figure in golden armor appeared from nowhere and parried the death blow with an ornate spear. The memory of the heart strike, only narrowly turned aside by Ross's thick chestplate brought back an ocean of pain, but it was washed away by the joyous remembrance of tearing the assassin apart a second later. Magnus the Red was long gone, but the corpse of the golden armored warrior remained. He recognized the man for what he was, a member of the Adeptus Custodes, his father's personal bodyguard. He also found the remains of the Golden Thunderbolt sigil that had been destroyed by the Guardian Spear's thrust. With an iron certainty, Russ knew the truth of the matter. From the actions of the Adeptus Custodes, it was painfully clear that the Emperor not only condoned the sorcery that Magnus had perpetrated, but stood proudly with him. Ross also recognized the Thunderbolt sigil for the focus of psychic power. It most certainly was. While he had worn it, Ross had been influenced to be utterly loyal to his All-Father. After its destruction, Ross could see the Emperor for what he truly was. The Arch-Witch. With the Thousand Suns gone, Prospero's shining cities in ruins and its mutant population put to the sword, Rusk tasked his legion with an even greater challenge. The whispers of his new patron in his ears, Rusk declared that they would tear down the imperial palace and put the emperor to the sword. The news that Rogel Dorn had also seen the light and had crushed three legions loyal to the emperor roused the space walls to jubilation. It seemed that at last mankind was awakening to the threat. 
and was rising up as one against sorcery. In a state of high excitement, the Legion returned to its fleet and set course for Terra to join the revolution. This celebratory mood rapidly soured though, as the Legion immersed themselves in the worship of Korn with riotous bouts of bloodletting and head-taking. Worse still, what was always going to be a long journey seemed to be cursed. The tides of the warp had turned against them, slowing their progress to a crawl and sweeping them far off course. The fleet's navigators were blamed, either through incompetence or by intent. Yet even though most blood-curdling of torments failed to right their course, Russ's realization that their newfound gifts allowed them to traverse the warp as well as any navigator put an end to the mutants' lives, but not to the fleet's predicament. Cooped up with no one but each other to vent their frustration upon, Russ became concerned they would either arrive too late or that the Legion would destroy itself long before it reached Terra. Their salvation came from an unexpected source, the Dark Angels, when yet another warp jump deposited then far off course and within hailing distance of a Dark Angels fleet. The Space Wolves prepared to continue their long-standing feud. Instead, they were greeted warmly as fellow enlightened of chaos. Luther, the Dark Angel's commander, said that he had personally slain Johnson for the glory of chaos, and further claimed to have embraced and studied the Dark Gods in all their aspects. With Luther's aid, the Space Wolves were able to control and direct their aggression. This was performed in a symbolic bloodletting on the planet of Dulon. Even though the world had sided with chaos, the two legions tore down the crimson fortress of its ruler, the tyrant Durath. The blood pact sealed with Durath's evisceration gave the Space Wolves a deeper understanding of Korn. From then on, Ross and his brothers had the chance to be masters of the blood tide, rather than its servants. Both fleets continued onwards, drawing torturously slowly but surely towards Terra, with the two Chaos Legions only days from their destination. And the war balanced upon a knife edge, the Emperor was forced into a desperate gamble to attack the leader of the heresy on his flagship. Though Dorne was killed and the heart torn out of the Chaos Legions on Terra, it left the Emperor a broken, mortally wounded husk. Even with the Chaos Legions in full retreat, and the vengeful loyalists eager to avenge their fallen lord, Rus still continued onwards. It was only the Sage Council of Luther that turned him from the path of certain destruction. He said that they must have faith, that everything had transpired according to Korn's great plan. With the Imperium in such a state of up upheaval, there was an entire galaxy of skulls ripe for the harvesting. The idea that Korn himself had prevented them from reaching Terra in time did not go down well with the Space Wolves. With Wolf Lords openly voicing their disgust, at last, however, Ross turned them aside, and they set course for Fenris, leaving a swath of butchered worlds in their wake. As the Imperium regained its strength, it took to reclaiming the worlds which had sided with chaos during the Dornian heresy. The ancestral homeworlds of the so-called traitor legions were particular prizes for them but were something that would only be attempted by the mass crusades of the loyalist Astartes, excepting Macraj, which has not fallen to this day. Fenris was the last Astartes homeworld to fall. For long periods, it was isolated by swirling warp storms from the Eye of Terror, which as though attracted by the worship of the Blood God, had swept out to encompass Fenris. Still, the consummate raider, Russ, 
use the brief periods in which the warp was calm to bring the judgment of Korn down upon the already weakened Imperium, always returning to Fenris just before the storm descended once more. Eventually, three years shy of the second century anniversary of the Emperor's entombment inside his golden throne, the warp storms enshrouding Fenris briefly clear and a crusade was launched to assault the world with overwhelming strength. The loyalists had hoped that their relative isolation would have caused the skull takers to turn upon one another, depleting their numbers, but this was not to be. During the scourging of Fenris, every isolated island became a battleground. The animals and even the landscape itself seemed to rise up as though driven by the will of the Blood God to oppose the invaders. The war of attrition stretched from weeks to months, but finally, under a burning sun that filled the sky with ominous portent, the Imperial forces broached the walls of the Fang itself. Though there were other legions and indeed Primarchs fighting across Fenris, only the Thousand Sons led by Magnus the Red, the Word Bearers commanded by Lorgar Aurelian, and the Black Templars under High Lord Abaddon set foot inside the Space Wolves' mighty fortress monastery. In the centuries since the Wolf King and the Cyclops had fought to a standstill on Prospero, Ross had become both a demon Primarch and an avatar of Korn. In such a clash, no mere mortal could hope to survive, and the Fang's massive halls were choked with the dead of both sides. Then, after three days, the Loyalists simply withdrew and returned to their ships. The only sign the Space Wolves found of their Primarch was his Frostblade, Mjolnar, and his massive empty suit of demon armor scattered outside the entrance to his personal temple to Korn. Though consumed by the disappearance of their Primarch, there was no time for the Space Wolves to ascertain Russ's location, or even if he was still alive. The Loyalists had fled because the world itself was dying, its ever-eccentric orbit in terminal decay. The Space Wolves blamed the Thousand Suns, claiming that only the foulest of sorceries could have performed such a deed. Bereft of their Primarch, and with their world tearing itself apart, the Legion did the same. Some remained on Fenris and slaked their bloodlust by killing whoever they could find before the end. Most took to their ships and were scattered across the galaxy by the tides of the warp content simply to wreak their vengeance upon the Imperium. After the disappearance of Lehman Russ, the Space Wolves' fiercely headstrong and independent nature meant that no single Wolflord could claim the unanimous support of their peers. As a result, the Legion fractured into great companies, with charismatic Wolflords such as Krill Grimblood, Hengst Bloodmane and Bjorn the Fellhanded, leading their brothers out on disparate, uncoordinated rampages. In time, even these allegiances began to fracture. The first to depart were groups of younger Astartes, who broke away from what they saw as the stead and complacent rule of their commanders. As Death or Spawn who had claimed the original Wolf Lords, feuds erupted amongst those who sought to succeed them. Such confrontations generally end with the victor claiming the skulls of his challengers, but on occasion, it has led to the acrimonious breakdown of once mighty great companies. Newly inducted marines start out grouped together into large packs known as blood claws. With the vitality of youth, they rush headlong towards the enemy to spill blood in the name of Korn. Those skilled or lucky to survive long enough to assimilate Luther's insights take a more measured and even more effective approach to battle. These grey hunters use stealth and cunning to quietly lope into position, the better to deliver swift death to their unsuspecting enemies. The finest exponents of Korn's art rise to the position of Wolfguard, 
They are the charged with the most important tasks, such as enforcing their master's will upon a difficult patch, or clearing a path for the wolf lord to challenge the enemy's leaders. The Legion has no love or need for the written word, instead storing all of its knowledge and history in the form of sagas recited aloud. While every brother strives to tell the epic tale of their deeds on the battlefield, the Legion specialists use it as an aid to complete their own tasks. The Iron Priests consign everything to memory in this way, from the operation of starships to the repair of weapons and armor. While the choosers of the slain use the sagas to recall the procedure for the creation of new space wolves. The Space Wolves ships are crewed by humans referred to as bondsmen. They attend to the Marines' needs and even follow them onto battlefield. Some are cultists of Khorne, who have consciously sought out the Legion in a vain attempt to prove their worthiness as Astartes. Most bondsmen are simply souls taken captive rather than swiftly killed during raids. In either case, such weaklings do not last long before running foul of one of their master's rages or becoming food for the Fenrisian wolves on the long journeys between battles. Addendum number one, the Wolf Brothers. Burning with the arrogance and certainty of youth and no longer burdened by their fealty to Lehman Russ, Large numbers of blood claws rejected the teachings of their elders and struck out to show the galaxy the meaning of unbridled aggression, willfully ignoring the structure of Luther's teachings, which they saw as an anathema to the purity of corn. Each competed to be the most brutal and bloodthirsty in honor of their god, though these so-called wolf brothers drowned the stars themselves in blood. Such intensity could never be sustained. They were rapidly consumed in the crucible of war, dead either at the hands of the enemy, or just as likely, murdered by each other. Such a fate is little deterrent, and periodically bands of rebellious blood claws leave the confines of their great companies to follow in the footsteps of the original Wolf Brothers. On the field of battle, the Blood Claws throw themselves madly towards the enemy. In their desire to fight, these young marines, often transformed into bestial wolfen, lose all thought of tactics or stealth. The more mature Astartes use their years of experience to work their way into position, ready to attack the enemy in its vulnerable flanks. The psychological effect of this cannot be overestimated. Even the most disciplined gun line has faltered and broken on the realization that they face not only an unrushing tide of claws and teeth, but that the enemy is already behind them and slaughtering its way towards them. While the Legion does not intentionally summon demons, such acts being much too akin to sorcery for their liking, the entities are drawn to the sites of their butchery anyway. Lesser demons have been observed to burst from corpses or exude themselves from pools of freshly spilled blood to aid in the slaughter. After the fight has been won and befitting their nomadic nature, the Legion and its assorted hangers-on they sent to pick the battlefield clean, guided by scent the Battle Brothers return to the sites of their kills to take trophies from worthy enemies. In the case of other Astartes, this can include weapons and pieces of armor to replace the damage that inevitably occurs. They rarely repaint it, preferring that it remain as a reminder of their battles and as a taunting sign to their enemies of their previous defeats. In their wake, come the choosers of the slain. They stalk the battlefield, selecting skulls adjudged to be particularly prized by corn. They also claim the gene seed of fallen space walls, 
and select those enemies who fought well enough to be saved from the brink of death and forcibly initiated into the Legion. Under the direction of the Iron Priests, the Legion's bondsmen are sent out to scour the area for anything of use, as the Space Wolves have little manufacturing capacity and even less interest in settling down to use it. Almost everything they have has to be scavenged, ranging from bolt rounds to entire land raiders. Only when the Fenrisian wolves have returned from chasing down and glutting themselves upon enemies that fled in cowardice from the battlefield, does the Legion start its journey to the next battle. Addendum number 2 the Collars of Corn, Worn by the warriors of Fenris as a ward against magic, Iron Neck Torques became common even amongst the Terramorn members of the Space Wolves. After the Legion came to the worship of the Blood God, they took to calling them Collars of Corn and carved elaborate skull symbols into the metal. Far beyond simple superstition, these devices have potent protective effects against psychers and magic, corn being the bane of such things. As the custom is to anoint the collar in the blood of a defeated opponent, the chest armor of a space wolf is constantly splattered crimson. Sowing rain is this that collars taken from dead space wolves have been observed to exude blood for months or even years. The most infamous collar was crafted for Bjorn the Fell Handed, the iron for which supposedly came from the blood of thousands he had personally slain. It is said that Korn took exception to Bjorn's hubris at withholding that which was rightly his, and damned the Wolf Lord for his actions. At the climax of the Proxima Rebellion, the moment of his greatest triumph, Bjorn was struck down and consigned to eternity inside a dreadnought. Any son of Ross who dares to wear this collar is imbued with Bjorn's legendary fury and skill, although not, it seems, with a long life. Back in the earliest days of the Legion, the Space Wolves' method for gene seed implantation had been brutally idiosyncratic. Since their conversion to corn, this has become all the more acute. After the infant Primarchs had been stolen away and scattered across the galaxy, the Emperor ordered that the Legion's implants be created based upon what remained of their gene templates. In the case of the Space Wolves, the process was flawed resulting in extensive and crippling levels of rejection and mutation. A number of alternate therapies, based upon their Primarch's gene sequence, were investigated, but the one finally selected was known as the Helix Lupus. At first, the process was almost rejected, as it transformed the aspirants into incoherent savages, devoid of all reason. However, when the changes had subsided, it was recognized as the missing piece of the puzzle, reconfiguring the aspirant's body into a form far more amenable to the quirks of the Rust gene line. This was initially conducted under controlled conditions, with subjects restrained throughout the process and intravenously fed with the nutrients required to fuel their transformation. On taking command of the Legion, Russ changed these procedures dramatically. A sterile laboratory was no place for the birth of a space wolf of Fenris, and so immediately after the Helix Lupus was administered, aspirants were dropped into the mountainous waste of Asaheim. In the midst of change, these bestial creatures were expected to follow their urges, to hunt down and consume the flesh needed to reconfigure their bodies. They then had to show enough composure to return to the Fang, so that the process could be completed and their training begin in earnest. 
After the heresy, the application of the Helix Lupus became ever more brutal. On the battlefield, the Legion slaughters indiscriminately, dedicating their kills to Kor, their god of blood and skulls, stalking through the carnage like cadaverous rapes or the choosers of the slain. Part Apothecary, part Acolyte of Kor, they minister to the fallen brethren, deciding if they are worthy to live on or to yield up their gene seed and skulls to their god's throne. The choosers also select those enemies that have fought with sufficient valor and ferocity and proved worthy of joining Korn's legion. They are touched by the will of the blood god himself, with skills that far exceed the wit of even the most skilled Churigen. Under their ministrations, with the application of the Helix Lupus, even a mortal wound may be averted. Once marked by Korn in this way, the beast within is released and the long, agonizing process of transforming their bodies and minds into those of Sons of Rust can proceed. While traditional gene seed implantation processes require that the aspirants be no older than early puberty, it appears that the ministrations of the corrupted Helix Lupus can allow this process even in full-grown adult candidates. It has been suggested that it can even be used to forcibly corrupt Astartes of other legions to serve Korn. Though none of the loyal Astartes legions have ever admitted this has occurred with any of their brothers, it would certainly bring a new danger to the prospect of fighting against the Space Wolves. That is, doing so, they risk a fate far worse than death. In addition, to the bestial nature of the Helix Lupus. The Rust gene line has always exhibited certain quirks, such as their uncannily sharp senses and how their incisors grow long and tusk-like with age. Over the millennia, the warping power of chaos has bestowed further beneficial changes, which boost their already considerable strength and brutality. Under the watchful eyes of the choosers of the slain, this process has been guided to bring them ever closer to their ideal of the perfect killer. Fenris, the place of the Legion Spur, was a death world even before it was claimed by Kor. Its islands periodically sank beneath the waves, forcing the population to brave the kraken haunted seas in search of new homes. The fertile volcanic soils allowed them to grow crops in season to see them and their animals through the long cold winters, as well as grain for the brewing of ales. The planet's sole continent, Asaheim, was the only place insulated from this tectonic upheaval. Permanently raised up above the battering seas, its coastal was a single propitious cliff face, which meant that the first time humanity was able to set foot there was with the arrival of the Imperium. The animals that stalked the forests and mountain peaks of Asaheim were no less dangerous than those found in the oceans. Bears, mammoths, and most dangerous and iconic, the Fenrisian wolves. Packs of these had even been found on the islands, hunting the livestock and inhabitants, and well able to brave the seas in search of fresh prey. Though Fenris died when its erratic orbit plunged it deep in the heart of their sun, a more subtle death occurred when Rus returned after the heresy. Those that would not dedicate themselves to corn were culled and the turbulent seas ran red with the blood of the unenlightened. The twin losses of both Primarch and Homeworld shattered the Legion into warbands, which set off to the Sea of Stars in search of new planets on which to ply their murderous trade. On occasion, 
these war bands tire of the Imperium and gravitate to the Eye of Terror to test their blades and take the skulls from worshippers of the other gods of chaos. Like many other legions, they have claimed the world there, though not as a home, but as a shrine. It is this dead world, far beyond the prying censors of the Imperium's null ships, that the legion comes to make their offerings to Kor. The mountains of votive skulls stretch up into the demon-haunted clouds, a pile, they say, that supports and raises Korn's throne higher with every death, in a realm where the warp and the material plane intersect. Who is to say that they are wrong? Unable to accept that their ancestral home is truly gone, some space walls are drawn to return to Fenris system. This knowledge has been used by the Imperium, and in particular the Thousand Sons, to bring them to battle. The presence of the Legion's blood enemies, desecrating the site of their homeworld is an insult that no true son of Ross could ignore. Many a space wolf warband has gone willingly into the teeth of such a trap, the most glorious being the fate of the Wolf Lord Skyrar and his Dark Wolves. They destroyed three escorting frigates, and even with their ship delibitated by wild magics, were able to ram the Thousand Suns battle barge and catastrophically breach its warp core. Long after it had closed, the echoes of Skyrar's rifts still pulse through the Fenris system as a sign of their defiance. Since their enlightenment at Prospero, the Space Wolves have dedicated themselves to the worship of Korn, slaying entire systems in his name. Without the structures of faith gifted to them by Lufer, their wild, self-destructive excesses would long since have driven the Legion to extinction. As a mark of respect, the Dark Angels are one of the few of the Chaos Legions the Space Wolves are willing to fight alongside. They usually prefer to fight alone, confident that even while heavily outnumbered, they are more than a match for any opponent. While the fate of Lehman Russ is unknown, every Space Wolf has a theory. Some say that, like Robute Gilliman, he was captured by the Imperial Primarchs and returned to Terra in chains. Others say that he was banished to the Warp, or that his very essence was annihilated by Magnus's psychic power. They all agree, however, that even death itself will not be able to prevent Ross from returning to reunite the Legion for the final great battle, the Wolf Time. Some believe that with the forces of chaos gathering and finally organizing themselves for an almighty attack upon the Imperium, that the end of days is at hand and that Russ's return is imminent. Having been denied setting foot upon Terra during the Dornian heresy, they believe that no power in the universe could prevent him from taking his part in the final destruction of the Arch Sorcerer. As for their battle cry, usually the only thing the Space Wolves opponents hear before the attack is the berserk ravening howl of the Blood Claw Packs. But on occasions where the whole force fights out in the open, for Ross, for Skulls, for the Wolf Time, is frequently used as a battle cry by the Wolf Lord. You thought your space wolves were brutish and uncultured? I implore you to think again. <laughs>